protect us as we continue our mission of celebrating and promoting Jewish history, life, and culture, and their positive and far-reaching impact on the world. Enjoy the following presentation, and if you start to quell, visit whyilovejewish.org to support our cause. Thank you. What inspires a young person to go to war? What compels him or her to change the trajectory of their life and blindly jump into the unknown, the hell of combat, and the uncertainty of whether or not they'll come out the other side? And where do they find the courage and strength to endure? Well, there's obviously no one answer, but fortunately, some who served are commemorated via their correspondence. And today, through letters to and from home, we begin a journey that dates back to World War II. We're calling it Kisses for Ellen. Coney Island, the world's greatest fun frolic, with its beach miles long, all peppered with people. The place where merriment is king. mingle with one million folks, folks who are just like all of us, 10,000 youngsters and oldsters, all swimming, playing, or resting, all getting their share of the sun and the fun, all refugees from the city heat, here where the beach meets the cool Atlantic, here in this great whirlpool of joy, here for a lark at Coney Island, world's biggest barrel of fun. Summers in the 1940s, Coney Island attracted about 100,000 visitors a day, and that's almost twice the crowd that flocks to Disney World today. And on Surf Avenue between 28th and 29th, Ida and Julia Silverman shared a sizable apartment with their son, Jaime, short for Herman, daughter Ray, her husband Jack Walker, and their baby daughter, Ellen. Housing was limited during the war years, but the extended family fit comfortably. On the same block as the apartment, Mom and Pop Silverman ran a grocery store. Of course, a war in Europe and the Pacific was raging, and, like so many young men, Jaime heard his country's call and enlisted in the Marines and signed up as an officer candidate. December 4th, 1942. Bob Starr, or Barney, Jaime's best friend, writes, Dear Fat Stuff, congratulations. I really am glad they accepted you, but then again, how could they help it? <laughs> For as long as you have to enter the service, you might as well make the best of it. But don't forget, there's a long, hard road ahead of you, so don't count your chickens just yet. If it'll help any, I want you to know I'll be rooting for you every minute. I will be mighty proud to salute you. <laughs> Boy, the Marines really took on a job when they took you on. Lieutenant Herman S. Silverman, United States Marines. Hmm. 
Sounds swell. Right soon, Barney. Five days later, Barney gets the news that Jaime will be off to Paris Island. His greeting is uh, a bit more formal. Lieutenant H. Silverman, dear sir, I really am sorry to hear that they're taking you so soon, but I guess there's nothing we can do about it. Oh, well. Now that you're in the service, we can expect the war to be over soon. <laughs> hey, I'm going to be in town this Saturday. Try and meet me in front of the USO at Penn Station at 930. And if possible, bring a couple of babes along. Barney. There's no record of whether or not that happened. Memorandum for Reservists. Bring your original orders and seven copies to Paris Island with you. Perform the travel in accordance with your itinerary. Do not start early. Do not arrive later than scheduled. Do not bring extra civilian clothing to Paris Island. You will not be allowed to wear civilian clothing. Bring toilet articles, razor, brush, toothbrush. May 6, 1943. My dear, darling, lovely, and gorgeous, and most delightful niece, baby Ellen. Today is Sunday, another day closer to victory. I wish you would send to Paris Island that detective who closes the store every Sunday. Perhaps he could force my sergeant to give us Sunday off. Please tell your mother, my sister, that the post exchange down here is exceedingly anemic in stock, and therefore I cannot obtain the pillowcase she requested. I just realized it. Today is my first anniversary in the United States Marine Corps. It is exactly one month since I've become an active member of the Corps, and gee, kid, time is certainly flying. In another month, I expect to be home shouting, Hey, Mom, give me eat. <laughs> I just completed washing my clothes. Oh, how I wish I had a Brighton laundry in the vicinity. Perhaps you can send me Mr. Miller, the laundry man, at least once a week. This may be a tough and hard life, but I wouldn't trade it for $10,000, and I wouldn't go through it again for another $10,000. I'm asking for an extension of boot training, like H-E-double-L. -L. In another five minutes, I shall be comforted with one quart of milk and one pint of ice cream, both of which shall be duly annihilated by your loving uncle. I sometimes feel sorry for you poor neglected civilians. <laughs> Love, Uncle Jaime. Marines in the Making was a 1942 short produced by Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. Nominated for a 1943 Oscar for Best Short Subject, aside from love of country, this film was probably one of the reasons why enlistment in the Marines soared during World War II. According to the film, fresh-faced young men, eager to fight for Uncle Sam, were about to face weeks of training that would challenge the strongest recruits. Listen to him growl. Getting tough? Well, they ain't exactly pushovers, brother. Mm -mm. But in that May of 43, Jaime's letters reflected a somewhat less aggressive training regimen. May 9, 1943. I've already cleaned my rifle, washed my socks, and made my bed. Since today is Sunday, I hardly believe we'll do any marching or rifle work. We eat chow regularly, three times a day, at 6 a.m., 12 noon, and 5 p.m., and the food isn't bad at all. In fact, the sergeant told me I would lose weight. And did he burn up when I actually gained weight? <laughs> I feel sorry for about 50% of the barrack because they become constipated and haven't moved their bowels since they arrived. As for me, twice a day, regularly. <laughs> because of the fact that we are all officer candidates, I believe that we won't have to do any KP. Boy, we certainly get plenty of privileges that the other ordinary privates don't even dream of getting. It's really a great life out here on the island. Everything is done with high precision and according to regulation. I certainly enjoy the marine training. We are plenty healthy, and by gosh, when we're through, each and every one of us will be rugged individuals. Time flies out here. All the members of my platoon are damn nice guys. The Westerners rile the Southerners, and the Southerners rile the Northerners, and I rile all of them. <laughs> and we all of us get along swell.
At the moment, some of them are harmonizing and doing a good job of it. There are four Jewish boys in my platoon, but it doesn't make a difference because religious difficulties never come up. Please, Mom and Pop, do me a favor. And get someone to help you run the store. The only thing that plagues my mind is the thought that you're working too hard. It doesn't pay. So please, find someone to make things easier for you. Kiss Ellen for me. Jaime. Race riots in Detroit leave 35 Americans dead. Truth is, the Detroit riot of 1943 was one of many that swept through the country from New York to Los Angeles. But Detroit represented the worst of it. The cause? That's a familiar story by now, some 76 years later. From the Detroit Historical Society comes this perspective. The Detroit race riot of 1943 was deeply rooted in racism, poor living conditions, and unequal access to goods and services. The apparent industrial prosperity that made Detroit the arsenal of democracy masked a deeper social unrest that erupted during the summer of 1943. The KKK was active in the region, and riots had already broken out in other cities. Before and during World War II, Workers migrated north to seek factory employment in such vast numbers that Detroit was incapable of adequately receiving them. Because black Detroiters were still treated as second-class citizens, they suffered disproportionately from wartime rationing and the overall strains on the city. Factories offered employment but not housing, and because whites violently defended the borders of their segregated neighborhoods, black residents had little choice but to suffer in repulsive living conditions. Detroit's 200,000 black residents were marginalized into small, subdivided apartments that often housed multiple families. They were crammed into 60 square blocks on the city's east side, an area ironically known as Paradise Valley. Because there was simply no space left to expand upon already existing African-American neighborhoods, the city attempted to construct a black housing project in what was otherwise a white neighborhood. A mob of more than 1,000 whites, some of whom were armed, lit a cross on fire and angrily picketed the arrival of their African-American neighbors. Black workers faced virulent racism on the job as well. In June of 1943, white workers halted production to protest the promotion of their African-American co-workers. Other factories faced habitual slowdowns by bigoted whites who refused to work alongside African Americans. Humiliation and resentment on each side spilled over into all facets of Detroiters' wartime struggle, and by the early 1940s, racially motivated street fights were common. One week after the Detroit riots, Jack, Ellen's father, writes, June 27th, 1943. I suppose you will or you have read about these race riots in Detroit. Whatever the actual cause, these riots halt production of valuable war implements a hundredfold more times than the biggest strikes. Even after the physical violence of the riots has been halted and quelled, when the men return to their jobs, they don't seem to give one hoot whether a task is performed right or not. These men then feel, especially the Negroes, that this war is not their war. Badly needed production often spells disaster for some army waiting for supplies in some part of the globe when it's slowed down to a dangerous degree. Some means will have to be taken to restore morale in Detroit once more. A tough job, though. I have my own ideas about what can be done towards preventing future outbreaks. Simply to take the parties in Detroit that have been fomenting dissension for years and heave them in the clink. Namely, the KKK, Coughlin, the Silver Shirts, and those phony newspapermen that blame every incident on the colored race. The Coughlin of whom Jack refers was Father Charles Coughlin, a priest who had a radio show in Royal Oak, Michigan, that was first broadcast in the 1920s and continued into the 1960s. He spouted anti-Semitic and anti-capitalist views, and his sympathetic stance toward the Nazi regime eventually proved too much for the times. He was silenced by the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, 
There is written in the Constitution of the United States that Congress has the right to coin, issue, and regulate the value of money. That's good Americanism, and it's good enough for me. Every politician today in the Democratic or Republican ranks who sits upon one of the thrones of the mighty doesn't believe in that part of the Constitution. They don't want to believe in that part of the Constitution. They believe that the Federal Reserve Bank has the right to coin and regulate the value of money. They're not even Americans, these so-called Democrats and Republicans. The Silver Shirts was another white supremacist, anti-Semitic group that was fashioned after Hitler's brown shirts. With Nazi German funding, they believed they could spearhead a new Christian commonwealth in the United States, which would register all Jews in a national census, then systematically reduce their role in business, government, and cultural affairs, ultimately confining all Jews within one city in each state. Their 15,000 members would eventually prove to be one of the largest pro-Hitler organizations in the United States. How about that? Sound familiar? And I like the way Jack thinks. But quite honestly, I had never heard of the Detroit riots of June 20, 1943, and that's what has been so exciting about this project. Kisses for Ellen was intended to introduce you to this wonderful young Jewish Marine and his family, and of course, Ellen. But as we learn more about them, we take little side trips in history and discover places, events, and people we might have forgotten or never even heard about. For instance, I personally learned that during my career in broadcasting, I actually crossed paths with a close ancestor of Father Coughlin. So now, and I have tossed and turned about this, but I want to present the Iwo Jima episode of Kisses for Ellen. Oh, there's plenty between where we left off in Jaime's training and the sands of Iwo Jima. But I really want to share this breathtaking chapter. So hold on tight and we'll see you on the other side of this horrific and historic battle. Anyone who thinks or says that he's not afraid or frightened prior to any engagement is without any doubt blowing steam and is definitely full of shit. At times, I'm forced to agree with some members of this organization who say they are not scared because I feel that they are too stupid to be afraid or to know when to be scared. There are occasions when I hope I, too, possess those carefree characteristics. And again, I truly hope that I can account for myself and do my bit when the stage is set for my act. Right now, a little seasickness is overtaking this powerful, brave Marine. That plus a tickling sensation within compel me to secure this letter. I'll write you again at the first opportunity after all is said and done. My love to all, and a special big kiss for Ellen, who I miss so, so much. Private H. Silverman. About 750 miles off the coast of Japan, due south of Tokyo, lies the island of Iwo Jima. The bloodiest fighting of World War II was about to begin and Jaime was on his way along with approximately 70,000 Marines. One-tenth of them, 7,000 souls, would never return home. We join the Battle of Iwo Jima with Jaime on Kisses for Ellen. On June 15, 1944, prior to the landing of the Marines, Army Air Forces and the Navy pounded the island. The bombardment continued until February 19, 1945. Unfortunately for the Marines, about 21,000 Japanese soldiers had holed up in some 11 miles of tunnels and rooms underground, located on the slopes of Mount Suribachi. The steady shelling had little effect. The day before, day one of the Battle of Iwo Jima, February 18, this letter from Jaime. Dear Jack, I'm not sure as to when you'll receive this letter. 
In fact, I am doubtful as to whether you will receive it at all. However, should all go well, and by the time you do get a hold of this, the news will probably be comparatively ancient. Right now, to me and all my buddies aboard this ship, thanks to us, will be tomorrow's headlines. You see, at this very moment, we're en route for combat. Permission, via the censorship authorities, has been granted us the privilege of expressing our feelings and perhaps the opinions that we harbor immediately before combat. I can truthfully say that each and every Marine aboard this vessel who may see action are in some state of uncertainty as to how he'll react if and when he's called to do his bit. Jaime's letter to Jack ends there. One can assume that the order for Lights Out came early as the next day saw the beginning of the bloody five-week battle of Iwo Jima. That same day, Jaime's sister Ray, halfway across the world, reported on a friend's wedding. My dearest brother, Lieutenant Toby wore his blues, white cap, navy jacket, royal blue pants and red stripe, and he looked resplendent. The only ones we knew besides Toby and his wife were the party we came with, and if it weren't for the fact that he had no folks and no family, we wouldn't have gone either. But we felt that we had to go because there was so little on his side, and, and he was really happy to see us. It was a very nice affair, and we were glad to see Toby get such a break. My dearest brother, it was while Toby walked down the aisle that I pictured you and your blues getting hitched to your Madam X. We are all looking forward to that day, and we hope it won't be very far away. By the way, it has already been arranged that Ellen will be the flower girl. Love from Mom and Pop, Jack and Ellen. Love, Ray. Jaime's letters, those which detailed combat, went only to his brother-in-law, Ellen's father, Jack. They were infrequent, of course, and to be for Jack's eyes only. Letters home were heavily censored. But, like so many other Marines, Jaime wanted to chronicle the battle while shielding his loved ones from the horror unfolding in front of him. In one correspondence, he simply tells Jack to inform them that everything is okay. Far from it. February 21, 1945. My dearest brother, Mom and I just heard over the radio that units of the 3rd Marine Division were sent to Iwo Jima as reinforcements, and a stab went through us. All we can do is hope that your unit remained on Guam, and if not, that by the time you receive this letter, you and many, many other Marines will be safe and sound. Pop just came up from the store after candling a few cases of eggs. Candling an egg is basically holding it up to a bright light to see if an embryo is developing. Obviously, if you're selling eggs, as eggs, you wouldn't want to see that. I could tell by the look on his face that he heard the same thing we did. It won't be long now, and I guess Mom and Pop will know the truth about where you really are and what you already did. Wherever you are, keep writing and writing, so that when the mail comes through, we'll get it in abundance and its contents containing good news. Take care and keep well. Love, Ray. Jaime, of course, was not left behind on Guam. But why were Marines being sent to Iwo Jima? Military strategists considered that, as the island had three airstrips, they could serve as a staging area for a future attack on the Japanese mainland. They believed that the battle would last but a few days, seeing as how the Japanese Navy and Air Force had been so badly crippled by earlier clashes in the Pacific. What they weren't aware of was the strategy of Japanese General Tadamichi Kuribayashi, using Iwo Jima's mountainous landscape and jungles to set up camouflaged artillery positions. The Japanese were ready for the attack, led by General Holland Howlin' Mad Smith. First obstacle, the beaches of the island. They consisted of steep dunes of soft gray volcanic ash, which made it nearly impossible for vehicles to advance. Footing for the supply and ammo-laden soldiers was almost as difficult. The Japanese lied in wait, not immediately responding to the Marine presence. This was part of General Kuribayashi's plan, 
After all, the Americans wrongly assumed that their pre-attacked bombardment had been a success in crippling the enemy's defenses. But while the Marines flailed in their attempt to advance, the Japanese artillery positions opened fire and inflicted considerable casualties. February 25th, 1945. Dearest Jack, Hiya! I'm still okay, still in the pink, and still shitting in my pants. You see, this letter is now being written approximately 1,000 yards away from the front lines during the battle for the possession of Iwo Jima. Every now and then a mortar shell finds its way close to my boudoir. Too darn close. As a result, we can't move without our steel helmets. My boudoir consists of a shell hole with a poncho for cover and protection against cold nights with rain as a dessert. As a matter of fact, it's beginning to rain now, as per usual. <laughs> Most of yesterday I spent on the front lines from the break of dawn to the late afternoon, when we were finally relieved. No need to tell you that the day seemed like a year. There were times when I actually thought the ye old scribe was en route to the St. Peter Express. Jack, this is definitely the worst campaign ever experienced by the Marines. The things I personally witnessed and experienced have a tendency to bring a lump in my throat and a chill down my spine. It is terrible and at times so heartbreaking that I feel like crying. And then again, at times we get that characteristic, barbarous nip feeling and become just as cruel and heartless and do and see things done with no feelings or thoughts of mercy. Jack, to write about this campaign would require a book worth of paper and inhuman patience, both of which I lack. The shells are whistling over again. Thank God they're on our side. I expect to be back on the lines tomorrow. Tough shit. I predict two more days of fierce fighting and then smooth sailing. While Jaime was writing from the beachhead that day, a buddy of his, Bob, or Huck as he was nicknamed, who was serving in the Navy, wrote, Dear Puffy, a few nights ago, while I was listening to the radio, a flash came over that the 3rd Marine Division had landed on Iwo Jima. I believe you can realize what I was thinking about and how worried I am. I keep hoping that, somehow or other, you are not included in this fight. Your next letter will most likely take ages in reaching me. It's always the way. No matter where you are or what you're doing, take care of yourself. Good luck and good fortune. Keep that fat ass down. Your pal, Huck. The next day, February 26, a naval chaplain, the Reverend E. Gage Hoteling, who spent 26 days with the 4th Marine Division on Iwo Jima, documented what he witnessed. His son, Kerry, provided World War II magazine with excerpts from his father's war diary, saying that his father felt that he would not be able to preach to this generation of people if he did not experience what they were going through. Last night was one I shall not soon forget. We had our second air raid right after dark, and all of the hundreds of ships in the harbor fired up tracer bullets at the enemy planes. It was as pretty a sight as I have ever seen, and fortunately, they drove the planes away. But last night was also the night of the great artillery duel. All of our artillery was scattered along the beach, and the Japs shelled our beach all night so that all the shells passed over our heads, going first one way and then the other. It was a steady performance all night. This morning we also moved to another foxhole that was vacated by some boys who were moving up toward the front. It was lined with some 96 sandbags on all four sides, and we rigged up good shelter over it with a poncho and two shelter halves, so it should be very comfortable for us. My foxhole buddy is a young second lieutenant from Buffalo, Jack Greeno, who graduated from Quantico. He is the division personal effects officer and will have charge of sending the personal effects home to the families of the men killed. He's a good egg and we kid each other a lot. He thought I was soft at first because I was a chaplain, but I showed him I could take it. 
So we get along okay now. We buried the first row, 50 men, in the cemetery today. Ever since we came ashore, the men of our outfit have been collecting the bodies. The engineers went over the cemetery area with mine detectors, and the bulldozer has been scooping out a large trench. When the whole row was buried, two of the boys went with me and placed a flag on each individual grave while I said the committal service over it. Here is what I said. You have gallantly given your life on foreign soil in order that others might live. Now we commit your body to the ground. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, may your soul rest in eternal peace. Amen. The chaplain went on to preach in several parishes in Massachusetts. He passed in May 2010. Jaime's letter of February 25th continues as he describes the visit in the foxhole from another heroic chaplain. Most of today, I spent with Leon Schnitzer, the chaplain whose stationery I'm using. Tomorrow should all go well. I'll ask the chaplain to write you. He can write a better letter, and besides, he has a typewriter. He's a swell guy, and only the laundry will tell how scared he is, to quote Schnitzer. Lem tells me he kept him awake all night shaking, and not because of the cold temp. Incidentally, I was shaking just as much for both reasons. We tried to find more about Chaplain Schnitzer, but could only determine that he was a Jewish chaplain. This from a publication called Jewish Chaplains in World War II by Philip S. Bernstein. The total picture of the American rabbinate overseas in World War II is one of which the American community can well be proud. 210 Jewish chaplains served overseas as compared with a total of six in the First World War. They accompanied American troops to all the battlefields of the global conflict. Jewish chaplains were in the armies that defeated Rommel in North Africa, that conquered the Anzio beachhead, that defeated the Germans in the Battle of the Bulge, that drove the Japanese out of Iwo Jima. The writer has visited most of the war areas and found everywhere a respect and appreciation for the service and the example of the Jewish chaplains. This was confirmed by all other missions sent overseas. It was universally reported that they gave a sense of dignity, of self-respect, and of stature to the Jewish personnel whom they served and represented. Boys are beginning to smell like ripe potatoes and overripe eggs. The dead and the live ones. There are times when I can hardly determine the living from the dead. They all look alike. Dead. From the look of things, I won't be able to write you again until this party is secure. My theme song. Uncle Sam, please take me back to Guam. So long. For a while, I hope. My love to all. And Ellen, too. And a big hug. Private Herman Silverman. From his position on the beach two days later, Jaime, true to his promise, wrote to his family. A stunning letter considering his real situation. February 27, 1945. Hello, folks. How are my five-star generals? I'll bet my mail hasn't come for the past two weeks. 
what, what happened is that after completing approximately four letters in the past ten days, the censors gave them all back to me because they felt that I was revealing too much. Much too much. And therefore, my mail to you is undoubtedly delayed. Life and conditions out here are what they are expected to be. Of course, there is room for improvement. Chow is up to par, and I'm in the pink. If I could be certain that everything at home is ship-shape, then this stranger would be perfectly happy and content. I won't risk saying too much, so I'll secure until my next letter. Love and kisses to all, especially Ellen. Private H. Silverman. March 3rd, 1945. Still at Iwo Jima. Let me out! Dear Jack, not much change since my last letter to you except that our lines have moved up several hundred yards at a great cost. I guess when it comes to the milk of humanity, the damn thing runs dry out here. No one can even imagine the dog-eat-dog setting out here unless he's been through it himself. It's a Hollywood scene with a hell of fury for atmosphere. This morning, the nip shells gave us an early reveille, but what they got in return ought to keep them awake for years to come. Again this afternoon, they threw several shells this way, no damage, but too close for comfort. For the past few days, we've been out looking for snipers that broke through our lines. Got one hiding in a dugout yesterday, but no luck today. The other day, we had some trapped in a cave and gave them the heat treatment. Flame throwing. They refused to be taken prisoner and we had no other alternative. Tough shit. Our boys, the 3rd Division, are doing a hell of a job. Without them, this operation would have been much costlier and longer. They've been the spearheads of every attack. At least I think so. No use talking. It's just one big, filthy bloody mess. I've just dropped a letter to my folks, and I hope that I haven't injected my true feelings into it. I tried not to. We did receive mail yesterday, and it was dropped practically into our laps. You see, they were parachuted to us, and believe it or not, Ellen's record was included. A fine time and a fine place for the recording. Guess I'll have to be forced to find a nip with a phonograph. I'll work a deal with him. <laughs> At any rate... I hope I can preserve it until I get away from this dusty, unearthly rock. And the sound of things, at this very moment, the nips are catching hell from our artillery. And it's music to my ears. I can lay down and watch those shells flying over my head en route to those bastard nips. There'll probably be another push soon. I know Ellen's birthday is brewing once again. There's nothing I can do. All I can give her is my best wishes and hope that her future is a happy, healthy, interesting, and most peaceful one. Until my next letter to you, my happiest and luckiest day will be when I'm heading towards the west coast of the USA. All my love to all, and a kiss for Ellen. As of March 5th, Jack, Jaime's confidant and cheerful champion, had yet to receive Jaime's letter of February 25th, but he had received his semi-cryptic letter of February 18th, the day before the invasion. Between that note and newscasts, Jack connected the dotted lines and wrote on March 5th, Dear veteran of two invasions, Well, old boy, by now, I am positive that the heir to Silverman's Dairy is definitely on Mary Iwo Jima, where no curfew exists and macabre celebrations never cease. How the hell did you ever get yourself in such a swindle? Couldn't you ask to be excused from this engagement due to a headache or a toothache? You'll have to do better next time. In addition to a hot invasion, I noticed that the good old 3rd Marines have been chosen to do most of the advancing and seem to be doing most of the fighting. At this moment, I am listening to the radio in the living room, which, by the way, cost me $3.35 today in order to purchase a peacetime tube of 60 cents, and this announcer is babbling all about the steady collapse of the German army. No kidding, Heim. By the time you receive this letter, the once much-vaunted Wehrmacht will be kaput. 
According to one of the marine combat correspondents on Iwo Jima, the weather, or rather the climate, on this two-bit by four-bit island is such that waylayers such as colds, the grip, and sore throats are rare despite rains and squalls prevailing. Hence, all one worries about is mere shrapnel, bullets, flak, sulfur fumes, volcano ash, and bombs. A comparatively safe place when I think of these damn mysterious colds which enter my head and exit via my feet, wreaking havoc on the trail down with my bones. These colds seem to be exclusive to Coney Island. Say, perhaps you could arrange a cook's tour for me to visit Iwo Jima. Perhaps the air would do me good. Pardon me a moment. What? <laughs> ah, there I go again. I'm not attempting to write too much until your first letter arrives, but all our fingers are crossed ever so firmly. So, I'll sign off with the most powerful wish for you to be and keep well. Love from family, Jack. The wait for that first letter didn't take long. March 6, 1945. My very dearest brother. A few minutes ago, Jack called up from his place just to tell us that he received a letter from you dated February 25th. He was unable to read the contents to me because his supervisor was standing over his neck. But just knowing that Jack had a letter from you was music to my ears. I immediately called up mom and pop in the store and let them know. <sighs> they know everything now. And of course, our suspicions that you were are on Iwo are now confirmed. Although we all knew in our hearts that you were on Iwo, we still felt that perhaps there was that hope inside us that your company was left behind. All we can do now is hope that you'll write us as often as you can and that you take care and keep well. That's all we ask right now. Then, hours later, Ray writes, When Jack got home at 2 a.m., he woke me up and there and then, I read your heartbreaking letter, even with its slices of humor injected in it. We decided against showing it to mom and pop, but just to tell them that you wrote that you're feeling fine and in the pink. Mom insisted upon reading the letter, so Jack had to tell her that he destroyed it, which he didn't. And we told them, what did it matter what you wrote as long as you did write and are okay? Mom and Pop were appeased momentarily, but they still aren't satisfied with what we told them. After this bitter campaign is over, we all hope you'll come home on a long, well-deserved furlough. Come safely home to us is all we ask. And on March 9th. My dearest brother, we all hope this letter finds you in good health. I just read that the Marines of the 3rd Division reached the clifftop overlooking the Northeast beaches. In your letter of February 25th, you said, I predict two more days of fierce fighting and then smooth sailing. If only your prediction had come true. Meanwhile, get your money back. Mom and Pop are buying Ellen a table and two chairs for her birthday. She will find it ideal and more comfortable for her to read and write letters to you. I will also buy her something and tell her that you sent it from overseas. She will be overjoyed. Take care and keep well. Love from Mom and Pop, Jack and Ellen. Love, Ray. This would be an appropriate time to remind you of why we're calling this podcast Kisses for Ellen. Jaime's little niece was never far from his thoughts. If we were to talk to Ellen today, and we will in a future episode, she'd reinforce that very special bond they shared and how, although she didn't know it at the time, she gave him the strength and stamina to survive. It would take your breath away, as it did mine, to see the photograph that Jaime carried in his breast pocket during those horrendous weeks. On the evening of March 9, 1945, the U.S. Army Air Force launched what went down as the most lethal attack in the history of warfare. Led by General Curtis LeMay, nearly 300 B-29 superfortresses dropped their massive incendiary bombs on Tokyo. In what the Japanese call Night of the Black Snow, 
some 100,000 civilians were killed and upwards of one million left homeless. While no one can underestimate the carnage left by the atomic bombs that came some five months later to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the devastation left by this event was even more destructive. 1,665 tons of incendiaries, including a half million cylinders of napalm and white phosphorus were dropped. Dry, windy weather conditions helped create a firestorm which destroyed almost 16 square miles of the city. While the fire still raged in Tokyo, spring-like weather conditions enveloped Coney Island, where Jack grabbed a pen and wrote, March 10th, 1945. Dear Hoyman, a few days ago, I received your thrill-packed, frightening letter filled with the bitter, brutal details of the now world-famous two-bit island of Iwo Jima. Wow, I can't imagine how that letter passed the censors. Were it not for a few cuss words interspersed throughout the letter, I would have surely sent it to the PM newspaper, who in turn would have surely published it. I consider it a classic. Naturally, we are saving it. And just think what memories those words will recall to you several years hence. Tell me, though, Jaime, have you actually engaged the Japs in hand-to-hand? -hand? At any rate, how do you fellas manage to survive the sulfur fumes and volcano ash? March 15, 1945. Still on Iwo Bastard Jima. Hi, Jack. I've just written the folks. Thought I'd drop a line to sort of put you and all concerned a bit at ease. I'm off the front lines now, safe and sound. How? <laughs> I don't know. And I guess they won't be needing us anymore for this campaign, I hope. There is still fighting going on the northern tip, but that's the 5th Division's worry and not ours. We did what we were supposed to do, and more, at a very great price. It hurts me to talk about it, even to think of it. Just chalk it up as an inhuman experience for mankind. I'd even call it inhuman and barbaric for the animal kingdom. Don't know how much longer they intend keeping us here. The sooner we get off, the better. I'll keep you posted. How's about more personal letters from you? I derive great kicks out of them. My best wishes for your daughter's birthday. Private H. Silverman. March 19, 1945, my choice family. Last night at approximately 9 p.m., news came from out of nowhere saying that the Nazis have finally collapsed and asked for peace. The war with Germany was over. You can imagine the celebrating, the joyous feeling each and every one of us felt within. As a result, more shooting and ammunition were expended to celebrate the great occasion and to help bring out that strange, pleasant, inward feeling, more firing than was necessary to take the island. But alas and alack, as usual, first thing this morning we learned that it was a lot of good old-fashioned baloney. I'm not too much dejected, for I still feel that the day of peace is not too far off. It wasn't until May 7th that Germany surrendered for real. We've all seen the iconic photograph of the flag being raised atop Mount Suribachi. That actually happened just four days into the fighting on February 23rd. On March 25th, 300 of Kuribayashi's men mounted what was to be their last bonsai attack. It was a brutal battle with heavy marine casualties, but the Americans prevailed and the next day declared the capture of Iwo Jima. Mopping up continued as American forces captured or killed the last Japanese holdouts who refused to surrender. Dozens more of our Marines were lost, and sadly, after suffering so many losses, neither the Army or Navy was able to use the island as a staging area. We'll leave this special Iwo Jima edition of Kisses for Ellen with this brutally frank letter dated March 20th, 1945. Still at Iwo Jima, dear Jack, my routine report and shouting that all is well, thank God, amen. 
We still make daily scavenger hunts through immense caves with dozens of exits and entrances, somewhat like catacombs in Egypt, only much darker, more frightful, and much more dangerous. This will continue for another week or two, and then perhaps we'll be relieved. I hope. We search the caves for intelligence, for snipers, and above all, for souvenirs, which doesn't interest me anymore. I read a news bulletin wherein it stated that a reporter from the Herald Tribune said that the 5th Division finally broke the northern sector of Iwo after several vicious days. Well, I want you to get this straight, that they, the 5th Division, were relieved from the front lines before they secured their sector, and that the 3rd Division went in for them, and that the 3rd Division made the final push through the northern sector to the mine beach, which was supposed to have been done by the 5th Division. It was their job, and they didn't do it. But I guess they had to give the 5th a build-up. From what I've seen, they didn't do a good job at all. And if it wasn't for their right flank, which was constantly breached, this would have been a much shorter and less bloodier campaign. The stench of the dead is still around the northern part, coming from the swollen, stinking bodies of the bastard nips, and also some marines who are yet to be removed for burial. Today there will be dedication ceremonies for the 3rd Division Cemetery. I may attend. At the moment, it's a rainy, dismal day, and if it continues, I won't attend. The speeches all commit to the same thing, saying that the men have not died in vain, and that before long we'll be out searching bigger and greater victories. Only they neglect to say that they'll undoubtedly be dedicating another third division cemetery somewhere else, and that's that. Did I tell you that several days ago I had my first shower and shave since we hit this island? I got permission to go aboard a merchant ship, and they treated me swell. After removing my clothes with a pickaxe, I showered for approximately one hour straight and then commenced to eat a hearty meal. To my amazement, I couldn't. My stomach wouldn't take it. Guess I'll have to adapt myself to decent food, like everything else. My best to all you folks. Kisses for Ellen. Jaime.